Good evening, and thank you for joining us tonight. Please welcome University of Maine President Robert Kennedy, former Secretary of Defense William Cohen, and Washington Post Assistant Managing Editor Bob Woodward. Please stand for our national anthem and the posting of the colors by UMaine Navy ROTC cadets. Good evening and welcome to the University of Maine. I'm Bob Kennedy. We are delighted to have you with us for tonight's event, which brings to you, Maine, two of the most distinguished visitors our university has ever hosted. Over the past decade, Cohen Lectures have been some of the most memorable, important events at the University of Maine, providing our students, faculty, and staff members, and friends from the community with the opportunity to hear from, interact with the likes of Madeleine Albright, John Glenn, Brian Mulrooney, and Dan Rather. Tonight, we add another impressive name to that list in Bob Woodward. Certainly one of America's greatest journalists, Bob Woodward has, since the 1970s, pulled back the curtain to reveal the inner workings of our government at the highest level. His work has allowed us citizens to better understand the power structures and those who occupy the most prominent roles in our government. Bob Woodward's work continues to inform our citizenry and make our society stronger. We welcome him to the University of Maine. And of course, all of these events have only been possible because of Bill Cohen. We are most grateful for Secretary Cohen's ongoing support and for his interest in helping UMaine serve the community and the state in a unique, invaluable way. way. I'd like to welcome some of the special guests who are with us tonight. Retired Admiral Grog Johnson and his wife Joy, both UMaine graduates. We're also proud that Grog, who is a senior military assistant to Secretary Cohen in the Pentagon, is a member of the University of Maine's Board of Visitors. 
Mr. Cohen's nephews, Jim and Mark Beckwith and their families, and representatives of our sponsors, the Bangor Daily News, WLBZ2, WCSH6, the Gannett Foundation, the Alan Miller Fund for Excellence in Communication and Journalism, the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, and the Honors College. We're delighted to host you this evening. Also with us are leaders from the statewide education community, public officials, and community leaders from all around the state, including state legislators. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Throughout Maine's history, our state has been home to innumerable accomplished and influential public servants, citizens who have selflessly devoted their careers to the high calling of government service. By any measure, Bill Cohen is among the most prominent of those men and women, and we at UMaine deeply value our long-term association with him. The remarkable archive created from the Cohen Papers is an invaluable resource for scholars studying American and world affairs of the past four decades. The archive is right here at UMaine, enhancing this university's academic stature significantly. Secretary Cohen also established the William S. Cohen Center for International Policy and Commerce at UMaine. The Cohen Center works to foster discussion of international policy issues and to encourage and support edu educational programming that will better prepare students and professionals to practice their disciplines on the world stage. The Cohen Center also works to promote and nurture the economic competitiveness of Maine businesses in the global marketplace. Secretary Cohen's example is a valuable one for our students to understand. From the most modest beginnings in Bangor, Bill Cohen aspired to do great things and he has met with incredible success. In Bill Cohen, the courage to aspire has met the work ethic necessary to achieve. His life and his achievements are the best kind of example, not only for our students, but for all of us. The people of Bangor are rightfully proud of Bill Cohen, as are the people from all across the state. At the University of Maine, we share that pride and look forward to a continued and growing relationship with one of Maine's favorite sons. Please join me in a warm University of Maine welcome for William S. Cohen. President Kennedy, thank you uh, very much uh, for your, uh, your comments, uh, always kind and most generous. Uh, and thank you for the leadership uh, you have provided to the university in helping uh, the Cohen Center to become such a, a vital and vibrant part uh, of the university. I really, truly appreciate all you've done to make that happen. Uh, as President Kennedy may have, uh, he didn't mention this, but I went to school just a few miles down the road <laughs> and um, at Bowdoin College. But I always felt that someone who uh, holds a public office ought to try to benefit a public university, and thus I made the decision to send all of my papers from my years in, the, in Congress and at the Pentagon uh, to this great university. And so that's why the Cohen Center is here, and that's why the papers are here, because I think that the people of Maine uh, should have access to them, since uh, you were the ones who put me where I was, and uh, I'm truly indebted to all of you. I might say it's a little bit of an emotional experience for me to be here uh, tonight at uh, come back and see so many friends and so many friends of my family. Uh, my father, Ruby, who was something of an institution in this, um, in this community in the greater Bangor area, he passed away some uh, 12 years ago, 12 years ago next Tuesday, as a matter of fact. And he's been on my mind quite a bit. And many of you have been uh, kind enough to ask about my mother, and uh, she's doing fine. She lives uh, very close to me and uh, Janet, and she is 88 and still uh, doing quite well. And it's emotional also, as I was uh, coming down the highway uh, with um, Bob Woodward in the car, uh, I was touched by the foliage that's starting to, uh, to bloom. And I can recall many, many years ago, I, uh, I wrote something, I scribbled it down as I was driving my children uh, through the countryside, much like I was seeing the, uh, the trees turn uh, today. And it went, I, I, I told Bob that I was gonna stall a little bit during my in introduction to him and recite something. Autumn just touches you one day in a way that no other moment does. The trees surrender their green for gold at the first touch of coal, and they cry quietly in color at the betrayal of the sun. The wind paints skin the hue of apple skins while spirits soar in concrete stadiums, 
and winter's scout cuts the throats of perennials and muffles the pain in ice. Strange how we rejoice in all the red knowing their lives are nearly dead, while our children play at paper graves dug by falling leaves. Stranger still, this custom of a family ride through the countryside, pointing at the splendor of it all. And that... Um, thank you. I'm not sure whether my, my English professor would give me much of a mark on that, but it, it made an impression on me. I also want to say a special word of thanks to Jan Staples, who's the director of the Cohen Center and who has worked so many years for me and so many campaigns and endeavors over the years. And Jan has put a tremendous amount of energy into making the programs at the Cohen Center a, a reality and uh, keeping us all on time here today, as a matter of fact. I called her general, then I demoted her and put her as a drill sergeant, but she has been right making sure that Bob and I get to wherever we have to be on time. Another special word for Paige Lilly, who's the archivist uh, for the papers from those 28 years of public service. She's done a spectacular job in sorting through all uh, the things that I've uh, written and done over the years. And I must tell you, this is really the first time I started flipping through all of the pages that are now on display, and I was astonished to see some of the handwritten notes that I wrote back in 1973-74 uh, on the Watergate era that I had completely forgotten about and have never seen since the time I wrote them. And there they are on display. And one of them, as I noticed going through uh, Bob Woodward, was a question that I was directing to Bill Colson, saying, do you know who Deep Throat is? Uh, <laughs> Colson didn't have an an answer for me at that time. But thank you, Paige, for all you've done. And there are so many friends who are here that uh, I can't recognize all of you, but uh, Bob, you, uh, Bob Kennedy, you've, you've taken away some of that, uh, that burden for me, but not a burden at all. Admiral Garg Johnson and Joy, who came from Harpswell, and Grog, uh, been a great uh, servant of this country, um, a, a combat pilot, uh, a, a commander of our forces. Uh, he's just been an outstanding um, servant uh, to this country, and I'm as pleased to have you serve me while I was at the Pentagon and, and all the things that you've done. Uh, on behalf of this country, so thank you and Joy for being here uh, tonight. Uh, I've told Bob uh, Woodward, uh, that, uh, who has served five years in the Navy, that I would ask Grog uh, whether he could find out whether Bob Woodward can be made an admiral. <laughs> and if not an admiral, could we reactivate him so we could send him off to Afghanistan? So. <laughs> Tim Woodcock uh, and uh, his wife Carol, other members of the Woodcock family, uh, Tim began with me some 30 years ago. Uh, when I first started running for the Senate, he was campaigning uh, all over the state, uh, and we were in his old jalopy, a beat up Volkswagen, exceeding the speed limit on many occasions. And we survived all that. Tim became a key member of the Senate staff. He actually was my chief counsel during the Iran Contra Committee investigation. And there were some side benefits to that because in the early 80s, Tim got to know a very attractive woman by the name of Carol uh, Hicks, who was also working on my staff. They, of course, uh, have been married for many years. They have three wonderful children, and he continues to be my personal lawyer to this day and is a great, close, personal friend. And um, let me say just a word uh, about uh, the, um, the Cohen Center and the, um, the events that we hold here at the university. Uh, as, um, President Kennedy has mentioned we've had many distinguished visitors and guests, uh, astronauts, prime ministers, uh, uh, senators, each of them very distinguished uh, individuals. I don't think we've ever had the enthusiasm and the anticipation that we've had for the special guests tonight that I've been so honored to bring to Maine. Uh, I think all of you know about Bob's background. It's quite familiar to most of you, but I will tell you that he has uh, worked for the Washington Post for 36 years. He's won nearly every award in American journalism that can bestow upon a reporter, beginning with the Pulitzer Prize, won by the Post in 1973 for the reporting job that he and Carl Bernstein did during the Watergate scandal. Uh, if he had never written another word beyond all the president's men, uh, his place in history would have been secure. But it turns out he was just getting started. And since reporting on Watergate, he has continued with story after story, breaking them in the Washington Post, including the Post articles in the aftermath of September 11, that won another Pulitzer Prize. Now, the Weekly Standard, not exactly uh, a liberal magazine, said that Bob Woodward is the best pure reporter of his generation, perhaps ever. Bob Schieffer of CBS News said Bob Woodward has established himself as the best reporter of our time and likely the best reporter of all time. 
And during the time that he's reporting, he also managed to write 14 books. 11 of them ended up as number one of the bestseller lists of a record that I don't think has ever been exceeded by another American writer. And uh, while all of this, I think, you be the judges of this, I would say indisputably that while his handwriting is not as good as mine as those documents you look at will reveal, he's better looking than Bob Redford, who played. <laughs> he's been a close friend of mine for, well, many years, ever since 1974. And I will tell you, as a 20-year-old, a 28-year-old Metro section reporter that he talked about earlier this afternoon, he had a precisely one year of uh, reporting experience under his belt, and I don't think it was even clear to him in 1972 when he was assigned to cover Watergate that his work would alter the, court, alter the course of American history and ultimately serve as the definitive work on what is both good and bad about the American system of government. Uh, Bob has said about those early days, he said, we were working on hundreds of different leads that were all pieces of a puzzle. It's like getting in the bathtub and turning the water on hotter and hotter until you don't feel it and it's possible to scald yourself to death. Well, he persevered, the truth came out, uh, and that was not the only possible outcome. The National Press Corps was not exactly aggressive in those days, perhaps even fearful of offending their sources within the White House. As a result, the Watergate story was not getting much attention except for those two very determined, dogged Metro desk reporters from the Washington Post that no one ever heard of. But it seemed to Bob very early on in the Watergate burglary, it was not just a third-rate burglary, as described by the White House, but just the tip of the iceberg, part of a scheme of a series of illegal activities that amounted to a subversion of our government and our Constitution. I know a lot of people are horrified about uh, what was taking place. They could not imagine they, they could occur. But I believe there's some good that came out of all of this because, <clears throat> as Watergate uh, showed, the system can and, and does work. Once Bob Wood was reporting, established the facts, and got the system to pay attention, the judiciary did its part, Congress did its part, and ultimately an independent prosecutor came to work within the executive branch. So ever since those years in Watergate, Bob has put his skills and his talents uh, to work examining the workings of each new administration, the Supreme Court, the Federal Reserve System, and the world of entertainment. And he's always wanted to gain a deep understanding of what was happening and why it's been happening. And he has inspired journalists um, the world over, I think, to really approach their craft with greater diligence. And to simply put, I think he's a national treasure whose unswerving commitment to seeking the truth has helped to keep our political leaders on their toes and keep our country strong. So it's a great pleasure for me to be here to offer you uh, the exceptional and talented Bob Woodward. Thank you, Bangor Billy. <laughs> Isn't that what they called you on the basketball court? <laughs> Imagine, he'd, he'd never make it in basketball now. <laughs> uh, thank you, it's great to be here. And, and it's, it's um, touching to see how uh, much this is a, a family that this is a community and not just a state, not just a, a university. And I want to divert for a moment. One of the interesting things about Bill Cohen, who I really have known since 1974, is he, uh, I, I was saying, asking him this afternoon, I said, do you go up uh, ever, you know, since you left the Senate, uh, the Pentagon as defense secretary, do you go up to the Senate and see uh, any of your old friends? And he turned to me and he said, I didn't really have any friends in the Senate. <laughs> and uh, they're, they're, that's not true. Uh, I, uh, many, I know many senators had immense respect for him, but there is an independent streak. Uh, in this man that is as wide as any of the highways here in Maine that are being torn up. <laughs> and it is that independence that I know is a tradition here in the state, but I saw him apply it in Watergate with great anguish 
for a Republic, young first term uh, Republican congressman to, in, in a sense, lead the Republicans in the House Judiciary Committee to say, no, we're going to hold, we have a higher standard here, we have to hold our Republican president accountable. Uh, he did it in Iran-Contra and serving on that committee. Again, very aggressively saying it's a Republican president. In this case, it was Reagan. Uh, we have to hold him accountable. And this afternoon, I know some of you were uh, here, and uh, the most important thing said was by him when he talked about his time as Secretary of Defense, and he, he said with passion and conviction, and this is a passion and conviction that he practiced, uh, he said he, as Secretary of Defense, the, right below the Commander-in-Chief, the President, looked at all members of the uniform military as if they were his children, sons and daughters, and that he would not send them into battle unless it was absolutely necessary. And that is a standard uh, that he practiced, uh, and it is a lesson for uh, hopefully all future secretaries of defense and presidents. Uh, there comes a time when you have to go to war, but it's a time when you want to make sure uh, there is no alternative. Uh, in the newspaper business, one of the things we do all the time is make mistakes. Anybody here uh, familiar with a newspaper making a mistake, please raise your hand. <laughs> I assume all hands are in the air. And it is, the, it is the thing we are uh, least capable of, uh, of admitting. There is not a tradition of acknowledging error, quite frankly. And one of my favorite stories about error and mistake has to do with the Catholic Church. And the cardinals were sitting around one afternoon and said, you know, maybe in Catholic doctrine going back 2,000 years, there's a mistake someplace. They got a team of monks together and went down and looked at everything written down in Catholic theology and doctrine. And because before the printing press, copies were copies of copies, the opportunity for a mistake was increased. And the team was gone for weeks, and the leading cardinal went down, and the team was all sitting down among all these old documents and tablets, and they... Uh, Every member of the team had his head down on a table, and they were crying, bawling. Cardinal went over and picked up the team leader, and the team leader looked at him, tears of despair coming down his face. He said, what's wrong? What have you found? And the team leader looked at the cardinal and said, the word was celebrate. <laughs> <laughs> Now that's serious error. <laughs> I, I, I'm from the Midwest. Took me four and a half minutes to get it. <laughs> uh, what I'd like to do is, is uh, talk briefly, and, and uh, Secretary Cohen suggested I keep this short, and I will, and uh, attempt to compress it. But I, it, it's about the Iraq War. Uh, what I think is the most important thing going on in the world right now. And uh, when uh, the war began, when President Bush ordered the invasion of Iraq in March of 2003, the Washington Post gave me one year. It said, take a year and go find out why and find out what happened. Uh, in the newspaper business, it is an immense luxury to have a year to do something like that, and, and the work you have, no matter what you do, uh, you probably never or only rarely get that much time to work on one problem. So I, I was able to work through people I knew in the CIA, the Pentagon, uh, the 
State Department, the White House, and you work up through the information chain and got information, notes, documents, memos, uh, through the assistant secretaries, through uh, key White House aides moving up, eventually interviewing the cabinet officer, going back and back, and uh, reduced it all to a 21-page memo of the highlights, kind of an excavation of the decision-making by President Bush in deciding to go to war. And I took the 21-page memo and sent it to President Bush. One colleague of mine at the Washington Post said, you sent George Bush a 21-page memo? Woodward, you are crazy. Don't you know his biography? There's no evidence that in all his years at Andover, Yale, and Harvard Business School that he ever read anything that long. Uh, as is often the case, my colleagues at the Post were uh, wrong, and uh, he did read it. And he had Condi Rice, who was then National Security Advisor, call me in. And uh, she said, you were going to write a book and a series of articles for the Washington Post about the decision to go to war, whether you talk to President Bush or not. And I said, of course I am. She said, he will see you tomorrow afternoon. And for two days, uh, I interviewed him for a total of three and a half hours uh, about the decision to go to war. Uh, researchers at the Washington Post have checked, and as best we can tell, it's the longest interview a sitting president has ever given on a single subject, going back to George Washington. Now, in that three and a half hours, how many questions do you think I got to ask him? Somebody? Somebody said two. Somebody said six. Uh, th two, six, that would be if it was Bill Clinton. <laughs> and that actually might be a high number. Uh, I asked Bush 500 questions. Uh, he gives very short, direct answers. <laughs> and uh, it, it, uh, it really covered everything. And I, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time going through it, but I want to uh, highlight a couple of things that illustrate the process he used in deciding to go to war. Uh, one of the questions I asked was, what was your father's recommendation on going to war? Uh, after all, your father had been president, was the only person to go to war with Saddam Hussein, would not be credible if you did not ask him. President Bush said, well, let's see. Uh, we talked. Uh, I was uh, cheered to hear that. Uh, and, you know, he wasn't up on the intelligence. Um, and, and you, know, I, you know, maybe we should call him. I was going to suggest. I, I figured he could get through. Uh, but he went on, and he took all these detours on this question about his, his father. And I was quite incredulous. And he uh, said that, oh, the, the Adams boys, referring to the former president, John Adams and John Quincy Adams, the father, son, and, uh, and he said, oh, no, John Quincy didn't have a war, so that's not the same sort of thing. And I, I uh, just asked, I said, didn't you just say, gee, Dad, what do you think? He said, no, he didn't think that, and I uh, was astonished. And finally, after pressing six or seven uh, more ways on that single question, he said what has been uh, much quoted, and rightly so. He said, in terms of strength, I appeal to a higher father. And I never got any information on what the lower father's recommendation was. Uh, now, now think about that. Uh, I asked John Kerry uh, about this uh, during the 2004 election because Kerry had read uh, the book that came out, Plan of Attack, which had this, and he said, Bush did not talk to his father. And I said, as best I can tell, he didn't. Uh, if you were there, 
Uh, he was racking his brain, and uh, the communication broke down or didn't exist or whatever Freudian, Oedipal, whatever's going on. And uh, John Kerry said, if he said, if I'd been president and was going to war, the first person I would have to the White House to consult would be President, former President George Herbert Walker Bush. He knew more about foreign policy, war, been a pilot in World War II, uh, been CIA director. Uh, the president did not consult his father. Now, in the course of doing uh, interviews like this, you're, the, the big question on all of my lists of questions was why. It's pulsing uh, in why do we go to war, weapons of mass destruction, the conviction, I believe, he believed uh, Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction. It looked like it was going to be easy. There was a feeling that Saddam Hussein was a threat. Uh, really hadn't got to the why. And then at one point he just said, uh, not in answer to a question, kind of out of the blue because he knew I was harping at this issue exactly because he's the decision maker. Uh, uh, why? And he uh, just said, quote, I believe we have a duty to free people, to liberate people. Duty, biggest word in the English language for a president of the United States. It's not in any law, it's not in the Constitution that we have to, we have a duty to go free and liberate people. He jumps in his chair in the Oval Office when he says that. I challenged him and said, aren't lots of people in countries going to think this is dangerously paternalistic of us? And uh, then he really got exercised and started slapping me around, not physically, but verbally. And he said, you don't get it. You don't understand. People who are liberated and freed appreciate it. And those of us who left, who led our countries, to war like Tony Blair, Great Britain, and, and he himself, George Bush, said, we have a zeal, president's word, zeal to liberate people. Uh, second biggest word in the English language for a president, zeal. If, as we go into 2008, you know what the candidate's definition of duty and zeal is, you will know real important chunk about who they are and how they might operate as president. I take on years of reporting on Bush and so forth, I, he, he, he believes this. He believes we have this duty. He wants to extend democracy to other countries uh, and end tyranny. You need to understand the idealistic pillar in him to understand why for four and a half years, he has not been willing to really alter course in that war, which is, it, it, in many ways could not have been going, is much worse. I mean, escalating violence uh, out of control, keeping it, uh, the level of violence basically secret uh, from the American public. And in Bush's mind, he's on the high road that this is a moral purpose, and almost the more difficult it gets, the more it demonstrates to him that it is necessary and that he has this duty and it fuels uh, that zeal that he has. Uh, after doing this book, uh, the Post again gave me time. It took about two and a half years this time to do the third book, State of Denial, Bush at War, Part three, uh, Bush at War Part three, came out uh, about a year ago, recounting the three and a half years after the invasion, what happened. And uh, essentially, the reporting demonstrated that uh, the Bush and members, key members of the administration in public were in a state of denial while they were getting classified reports regularly showing that the violence was increasing 
and the war was getting out of control. President, uh, a secret memo would come in from the Joint Chiefs of Staff uh, J2 Intelligence Division saying uh, violence has gone up to the point like it did spring of 2006, eight or 900 attacks on U.S. forces or Iraqi authorities, eight or 900 a week. That's more than 100 a day. That's four attacks an hour. Imagine what that is like to live in. Uh, we have not had one terrorist attack in this country since 9-11. If there were four a year in this country, we would be living. If there had been four in the six years since 9-11, we would be in a totally different security and political environment. They're dealing with four an hour. At these moments, these reports would come in. The president would go give a speech and say, we've turned the corner in Iraq. Dick Cheney went on the Larry King show in the midst of this and said, the terrorists are in their last throes. When one of the most devastating reports came in from the intelligence community say, uh, back in 2006 saying, it's getting, it's bad now, it's getting worse, and it's going to be even worse in 2007 president went to Chicago and gave a speech saying, this is the time in history that will mark the moment that the terrorists began their retreat. Uh, in 2005, uh, Steve Hadley, who's now uh, the national security advisor for President Bush, he'd been the deputy to Condi Rice the first term, took over as uh, the job in the be beginning of the second administration. Uh, this is the old Kissinger post, key person to coordinate uh, the Pentagon, the State Department, intelligence, the whole government on national security matters. A colleague asked Hadley, how do you think we're doing in the war in Iraq and implementing our foreign policy? And Hadley said privately, said, in implementing uh, our policy, I would give us a D minus, D minus, as in dog minus. How many people here ever got a D minus in high school, college, or graduate school? Raise your hands. Oh, come on, there's a lot of denial out there. <laughs> okay, for, the, the, for those uh, of you who never lingered in the bottom tier of the grade uh, scale, uh, a D minus is a very low grade. <laughs> you shake when you get something like that. That is the grade given by the President's National Security Advisor, not some columnist for the Washington Post or some Democrat or somebody from a think tank in Washington or elsewhere. That's the President's man. Does he say it publicly? Does he tell people publicly? No. Condi Rice becomes Secretary of State and moves over from the White House to the State Department. And she realizes she doesn't know what's going on in Iraq. Duh. So she hires uh, a man named Philip Zellico, who lawyer, historian, uh, the man who was the executive director of the 9-11 Commission, one of the best investigations ever conducted in Washington. And she says to him, go to Iraq, travel around, talk to anyone, and come back and tell me what's going on. Zellico goes for a couple of weeks, uh, comes back and writes a 17-page secret no-dis memo. Secret is classification. No-dis means uh, Secretary Cohn, uh, I think, knows that term, means no distribution to anybody except the person it's designated to. And this is the case. So uh, the memo only went to Condi Rice and me. <laughs> I, I have a liberal interpretation of no distribution. And I printed in the book. And Zellico comes back and says to the Secretary of State, 
Iraq is a failed state. Failed state. Secretary, the president, the vice president are out telling the world how everything is going quite well. Time and time again. Don Rumsfeld, Bill Cohen's successor as, uh, at the Pentagon as Secretary of Defense. In May last year, he'd been in charge of the war for over three years, writes a memo about the war to the president. Of course, it's classified secret, so it's not supposed to be public. And I printed it in the book, and Rumsfeld writes uh, that the interagency process, the coordination among the State Department, the Pentagon, intelligence agencies, and the White House is so screwed up, quote, competence is next to impossible, end quote. Competence is next to impossible. That's not some, again, that's not some critic, that's not some Democrat, that's not somebody in my business, that's the president's Secretary of Defense saying competence is next to impossible. I could go on and on about evidence to show that we didn't get the story uh, about the war. Uh, this, uh, I want to end on two things and then uh, we can do questions or a discussion. But I take that or going back to Watergate or Iran-Contra or uh, all kinds of things that happened in the government. I have the, again, the luxury of trying to think about what to worry about. And uh, if you were to, you know, we were to take a poll and get out a blackboard and say, you know, we worry about the state of the economy, another terrorist attack, global warming, uh, the environment, health care, you name it. There are a, a long list of problems. But the thing I think we have to worry about most is secret government. Secret government is what will do this democracy in. That's what Watergate was about, essentially. Nixon saying, oh, we've got the power. We're in charge. No one else need uh, be involved. Uh, whoever said it, I think one of the Supreme Court justices uh, got it right uh, when he said, democracies die in darkness. They do. And the secrecy, uh, for, in, in fairness to President Bush, for the third book, State of Denial, he declined to be interviewed. But in the first two books I, I did, as I said, I interviewed him for hours, and at one point I asked him about, this was, the question was weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, and nine months after the invasion, we hadn't found any. And uh, it was pretty evident that they weren't there, and I asked him why he did not acknowledge it. And I tell you, he was just so uneasy, he said, well, you know, the uh, weapons of mass destruction programs and tried to do play verbal games with it. And I said, look, we, we have 150,000 troops, uh, hundreds of intelligence people crawling around that country, and they, they haven't found one vial of anthrax or some biological weapon. There are no smoking vats. There are no bubbling vats. There's no, nothing. We haven't found anything. And finally, he said, True, true, true. And then, he, and then he, he said, now don't run down to the Washington Post and write a story. Uh, the president says no weapons found. And I had agreed I would, it would come out in the book four months later, <laughs> which it did. Uh, and I said to him uh, that I thought, and I thought the evidence of history demonstrated that Presidents are strong when they are the voice of realism. That after 9-11, President Bush came to the country and said, we've been hit, it's serious, this may last two generations, we're likely to be hit again, it is an act that will define an era, and so forth, and the, the country accepted that. People accept bad news. And this uh, 
habit and this tendency to deny, this uh, tendency to not be the voice of realism. One of the mistakes in the Iraq war, my view, is the failure to come forward and say, look, we've thought this, it turned out differently. Now we're going to have to recalibrate. We're going to have to re readjust. But there is none of that. There is that sense of, you know, you talk to people, bipartisan group of people on the Iraq study group last year, that is the most prominent Republicans and Democrats in many ways in the national security field and other fields, uh, cabinet officers and so forth, and they agreed that we have to essentially withdraw from Iraq. And the president decided instead of withdrawing, we would add more troops to serve. Go around and talk to these people. Uh, they are just, they, Republicans are flabbergasted that the remedy is more rather than less. Uh, last thing I wanted to mention uh, is the head of Simon & Schuster, which has published all of my books, years ago when I finished one, took me to dinner in New York City. And I realized something was up, good news, bad news, and he said, what's your next book going to be? I said, I wanted to do some reading, reporting, thinking. He said, reading, reporting, thinking? Uh, we are in the product delivery business and the marketing business. What's your damn next book going to be? He's one of these guys who, you know, who grinds on you for hours and hours. And he did, and by the dessert course, I finally said, I have figured out what my next book is going to be. And he said, well, at last, what? I said, my next book is going to be on the publishing business in New York City. <laughs> and he said, that's terrific. I have a great title for you. I said, there aren't any great titles left. He said, there's one. Your book on the publishing business in New York City will be called My Last Book. <laughs> he meant it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bob, for what your two remarkable talks here today at the University of Maine, and they will long be remembered, and I think you've given so many of us so much to think about, and uh, we really are grateful for your time with us today. I'd like to invite you and Secretary Cohen to return to the podium to respond to questions from members of our audience. In presenting the questions which have been written on cards during this evening's program is Professor Shannon Martin, Chair of UMaine's Department of Communication and Journalism. Shannon? How come you get to stay down there? <laughs> we can't even see her. I'll wait. Um, I have a pair of questions, one for each of you, and so you may want to decide who goes first after you've heard both of them. The one for uh, Mr. Woodward is, how do journalists learn to trust their informants and given the kind of trust you gave to Deep Throat? And would you feel in today's journalism environment that that was a reasonable thing to do. Um, and for um, Secretary Cohen, your papers record that um, as a congressman you were, uh, you promoted the enactment of a federal newsman's shield law that would protect reporters who find it impossible to ob obtain information unless they were um, allowed to uh, promise confidentiality. Yesterday the Senate Judiciary Committee passed a similar measure 15 to 2 and the questioner wonders if you were president and this shield law, uh, this shield bill came to your desk, would you sign it? Do you want me to answer first? Uh, I believed, uh, going back to 1973, I think is when I first uh, introduced that, or 74, uh, the uh, shield law. And guess who opposed it? The media. 
the media was absolutely opposed to it, saying we don't need any statutory law to protect our First Am uh, Amendment freedom. Uh, that is guaranteed to us by the Constitution. And therefore, even though you may be well motivated and highly motivated trying to protect the freedom of the press, uh, we don't need it. As a result, it died on the vine uh, at that time. And of course, because it was um, constructed at a time when the press was feeling uh, its oats, so to speak, you had Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein, the Washington Post, and uh, they were driving events at that time, it was very difficult for Richard Nixon or anyone else to start locking up members of the press, as we've seen most recently in the last several years. And so they felt that the, the First Amendment gave them full protection, where in fact a shield law drafted by me would restrict their rights, and so they were opposed to it. So the short answer is, um, if I were president, you wouldn't need a shield law, uh, because I would not be in the business of trying to put people in jail for refusing to reveal their sources. Uh, but if I were president and a law came to me, if I felt that it enlarged the freedom, uh, the, the First Amendment, I would sign it. If I felt it in any way compromised, then I wouldn't. But I think um, it depends on who's in that office. It depends on what the mood of the country is. Uh, and I can only speak for myself. The answer was you wouldn't need it if I were there. Okay. Uh, and the, the, the question is about uh, deep throat or informants, as they're called. I don't like to call them informants. I call them trusted sources. And uh, trusted sources are really important. It is a relationship of trust. Uh, you work on it, and uh, you you know, it's the old Reagan, uh, trust but verify. You check everything, and then you get to a point where there's some people you can count on what they say. But you need those kinds of sources to find out what's going on. Uh, in the last book, State of Denial, I have more classified information uh, than uh, is probably in some of the safes in the Pentagon, in the CIA, in that book. But it's in a form that doesn't jeopardize national security, does not uh, expose military operations or intelligence sources, but tells the people what's going on. And uh, the lawyers at my publisher said, you know, my God, you've got all, you say this top secret report and, the, and, and so forth. Uh, what are they gonna do? Are, you, are they gonna come after you? And my reaction was we should be so lucky because they would be in the absurd position of saying, we are going to try to find out uh, the author's sources or we are going to prosecute people who might have given information that told the American people the truth. I mean, think about that. And there was never a flutter from anybody in the government, to my knowledge, to pursue the sources. They wanted the book to go away. And uh, if they launched an investigation, it would put a spotlight on it. So I, I'm, I'm, you know, on the question of shield laws, um, I look forward to a day when we have a president who will say, I'm not going to be in the business of uh, letting my Justice Department chase the reporter sources. Uh, it, would, it would be a good thing. By and large, if you have good information and it's so relevant, and you're careful about not uh, getting people killed or harmed, uh, which I think you can do, uh, the government is not going to come after you. So a couple of um, addition to this. I, I don't want to be too sanctimonious about this, because when I was at the Defense Department, I used to cringe whenever I saw a report and said, who the hell let that story out? Uh, and, uh, and so, when you're in a position, the admiral is he's, he's laughing. <laughs> he probably heard me rage on, on many occasions. Uh, but obviously, if you're going to protect your national security, there are some things that really do need to be protected. Uh, what Bob Woodward is talking about is having a wholesale blanket on uh, disseminating any information, shutting everything down so that you really do um, infringe upon the democratic system. So it's always a balance. Uh, if you have uh, secrets that are, in fact, being leaked uh, and, they're, uh, and they are impacting the security of the country by putting people in jeopardy, sure, you want to speak out against that. You want to try to discourage that as best you can. But I never thought that the, uh, the way to do that is to, 
as to go after uh, journalists and put them in jail in order to squeeze uh, them for information. So uh, I, I think that it's always a balance. Uh, you want to try to create a culture where you ha the most valuable things that, um, that are need to be protected are protected. You can, in fact, go to people like Bob Woodward or several other people I could name and say, look, uh, you're asking me this question, I'm not going to misrepresent it. Let me tell you exactly what's taking place. It's off the record, but you have to assure me you're not going to publish this uh, in a certain time frame because you will put people in jeopardy. That can be done. It has been done. And I think the Post has done that uh, over the years with Ben Bradley and others. But the essence of a free society is that the public is entitled to information. Uh, and only those extreme circumstances do you say, uh, under these circumstances, that information shouldn't get out at this time. Uh, so it's a balance, uh, but I think the balance always is more information rather than less if possible. Can, can I just take this moment to give my uh, email address in case anybody has any information? Woodward B at washpost.com. It's very, it's very uh, simple. Uh, my name is also in the phone book. Thank you. And you can expect to see it in this next book. Mr. Woodward. Um, I understand you may have a question that you would like to ask the secretary. This is a, a question I get to ask Secretary Cohen, and I, th I think in the context, and I want to lead up to uh, the question by asking a question of the audience. How many people here have made a personal sacrifice because of the war in Iraq, Afghanistan, or the war on terror? Please raise your hand about three or four or five people. Uh, I, that is disturbing. And it's not the people's fault, it's the leadership's fault. That we have, particularly in the war in Iraq, it has been outsourced to the military. Those people who are over there, now if they're in the army for 15 months, what are they? They are our surrogates. And what do we owe them? Everything. What are we giving them? Uh, maybe 10, 15 percent of what uh, they deserve. And so I, I, I think we are just we are in a position where it really it, we are not a nation at war. We're military at war, and that most people are disconnected and numb about the war. And my, my question to Secretary Cohen goes back to 1998, Operation Desert Fox, when you uh, recommended and the President Clinton authorized the bombing of Iraq. And uh, the questions are, why did you do that? What was the nature of the operation? And how did it differ from what we've been doing uh, in the last four and a half years in Iraq. How much time do we have? For this? <laughs> <laughs> it's a great question, and I'll try to be as brief as possible. Uh, the reason that uh, I recommended to uh, President Clinton that we go forward and target um, Saddam Hussein's missile production facilities and his Republican Guard is because he had refused to allow the inspectors to carry out their mission. All of us at, in the Clinton administration, and I assume those in the Bush administration, had the, uh, we were operating on the basis of an assumption. Did we have absolute categorical evidence that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction? The answer is no. We had an assumption, and the question is, was it reasonable? And you say, well, based on empirical uh, experience, yes. He had them, he had used them against his own people, he had used them against the Iranians, and he had refused to account for them. Therefore, you assume he still has them. Did we think at that point, nonetheless, that he posed an imminent threat to us so that it required a massive invasion into Iraq? The answer was no. So we decided to formulate a, an attack plan that went after his missile production facilities and as many of his Republican Guard uh, as we could. And we knew it was going to be a very limited attack, no more than four days, and we were going to do as much damage as we could uh, in as short a period of time as possible. Uh, we did that. We suffered no losses. We had no intent to go into Iraq. And as a matter of fact, our plan was to stay out of Iraq 
And the only way we would ever go into Iraq is if he posed a threat to Kuwait, to the Saudis, to the Israelis, or started taking down our aircraft that were flying both the northern fly zone and, and southern fly zone. Um, and that, uh, if we had to go in, we called for between 400 and 500,000 troops to go in. That was our plan, and that was the plan that was dismissed as being obsolete, outmoded, unnecessary. But so I want it's limited war. It's, it's, it's not even, it, it's a limited it strike. It was a very limited strike in order to tell Saddam, you're going to be punished for this unless you allow the inspectors back in, and here's how we're going to do it. I will tell you, and Grog Johnson can verify this, Whenever Saddam launched either a surface-to-air missile at our aircraft or what they call AAA uh, fire at our aircraft, we went down and took out not only the site that was firing at us, but we took out multiple sites. We were systematically degrading his air defense capability over the last couple of years. And so he had very little left. We did not think, it comes down to again, would you go into Iraq? We did not think that he posed an imminent threat to us or to any of his neighbors because we had him under control. Was he cheating on the side? Was he uh, getting a billion here or a billion there and cheating on the oil for food program? The answer was yes. Did it put us in danger? And we said no in terms of our own judgment. So that was our approach to a very limited, discreet type of an attack that would last very limited time with uh, virtually limited exposure to our, our troops. I want to come back to something that Bob has just mentioned because it, I feel so strongly about this. Um, it pains me to see our kids over there. It pains me when I go to Walter Reed, uh, when my wife Janet goes out to Walter Reed in the evenings and she has to embrace uh, the young men and women who have no arms and no legs or half a head. It pains me to see what we have put them through, what they will have to endure the rest of their lives. And they get great treatment out at Walter Reed, notwithstanding the reports about the inadequacy of some of the rehabilitation uh, uh, follow-up uh, treatment. They get terrific treatment while they're at Walter Reed. The problem is when they go back to red state or blue state America, what kind of support do they have there? We have an obligation that uh, we haven't begun to even consider. Uh, the uh, Harvard study puts the price tag alone at $700 billion to take care of those uh, who have been wounded and will be wounded in Iraq and, uh, and Afghanistan. And other studies put it at three times that number. But aside from the, the, the numbers that we're talking about, I want to come back to what Bob uh, Woodward had just said. We are not a country at war. And the notion that we have this global war on terror, I think it's a misnomer, number one. It's not a war. It's what Kennedy called a long twilight struggle, not against communism but against terrorism. And it means that we're never going to know when it's over because we're always going to be in it. And it seems to me it is incumbent upon any president, any presidential candidate, to lay out a program that says, how can we make America great again? Because we have lost a commitment to the values and the virtues that have made this country strong, and it comes through sacrifice. None of us have had to sacrifice but the two or three who have raised their hand, other than, well, we pay taxes. We're not even paying taxes for the war, we're borrowing the money. Uh, I want to see a program of national service. I think that it's incumbent upon us to discipline ourselves to say, we live in the greatest country on the face of the planet. We have an obligation to this country. We are not fulfilling that obligation. We need to say that everybody must do something. Everybody can either join the military, join the Peace Corps, commit to AmeriCorps to do something on behalf of this country to say, we're all in this together because we haven't been in this together. And um, and now that I have a podium to simply say it's something that I think is vital to us, I think we're losing. I think if you go to other countries, you look what's taking place around the world, um, they are gaining, you're looking back, they're gaining on us. They are committed to doing something that uh, we once were predominantly uh, successful in. And so if we're going to be a, a great power, and I believe we're still a great power, and we're still the greatest power for doing good throughout the world. You just think about it. No other country can fulfill what we're doing, what we, we tax ourselves to do, but we're not gonna remain a great power, and you cannot remain a great power as long as the elite of this country send the sons and daughters of other people off to fight the wars they're unwilling to send the
Thank you very much for taking questions. I'm afraid we've run out of time. You have more questions? No more questions. Oh, I, can I ask myself one? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no. No, no. I have a question for you. Okay. okay. Um, I have several questions for you. Number one, if you would draw the distinction between how do you how are you uh, a reporter on the one hand, a journalist, and an author on the other? What is the deciding line as you're doing your book, Plan of Attack, um, State of Denial, Bush at War? Uh, what is the instinct that you have to say, I'm learning incredible things. I think I'll wait until Simon & Schuster, by the way, I have a conflict of interest. I'm on the board of CBS that owns Simon & Schuster. In any event, uh, Simon & Schuster will publish this next year. Uh, but uh, this information ought to be out now. How do you make a judgment in terms of what you turn into the newspaper and what you write? Yeah. Uh, that's an excellent question, and the answer is uh, you know it when you see it. Uh, and that uh, sometimes you get information, and I do stories for the paper. I am working on a book, and I think this go belongs in the paper, and I go back to the sources and say uh, this really – uh, should be in the paper. Uh, just a couple of months ago, I had a story about the current CIA director's assessment uh, uh, in Iraq, and he said that the ability of the government, and he'd given this report to people, and of course it was classified, and it said the ability of the government in Iraq, the Maliki government, to govern seems irreversible. In other words, it's so bad we can't fix it. And, uh, and so I ran the story, went back to the sources and said, we need to tell people that, in fact, the editor of the Post uh, went to one of the sources and said it would be a dereliction of duty if we didn't tell the people that the CIA director thinks that it seems irreversible. And uh, we ran the story, and uh, it was a day, the day of a Bush press conference, and it was astonishing. Bush was, of course, asked about it, and he said, well, CIA Director General Hayden was just in this morning, and I asked him about that uh, story, and the general said that what he, his evaluation was slightly more nuanced than the story. And it's, it's the first time George Bush ever used the word nuance. <laughs> uh, we Googled Bush and nuance, and, and it came up zero uh, uh, out of his own mouth. And uh, so we, that we felt there was an obligation to tell. Now, the, the question I wanted to ask uh, is, at the end of the interviews for Plan of Attack with Bush, the last question I asked him was, how do you think history is going to view your Iraq war? And he was standing in the Oval Office, had his hands in his pockets, and he took his hands out and he kind of shrugged about history. And he said, history, we won't know. We'll all be dead. <laughs> and and uh, I went home, my wife Elsa asked, how did the interview go? And I said, he answered all the questions, but the really good news is I have the ending to the book. <laughs> <laughs> And endings, endings are really hard. You know, you've written 10 or 11 books, uh, and, uh, and so that's the ending of the book. Now, Bush is, uh, he's ducking the question, of course, but, but also uh, there's a truth in what he says. We don't know about how this is going to come out. You look at Harry Truman 57 years ago, and it looked like Truman... Uh, as president during the Korean War, I mean, Truman's public uh, approval ratings were lower than Dick Cheney's now. Do you think that's possible? And he was thought, uh, Truman, to be inadequate or a fool in the presidency, and the Korean War uh, was in, uh, fantastically unpopular. And now historians come along and say, no, he's a courageous president. So it does look it's quite possible that it looks very different. So uh, the 
so I, when Plan of Attack came out, I was giving a talk uh, like this in Washington, and the other speaker was Senator Hillary Clinton. And afterwards, we talked. And uh, she, she said, you know, I quote from Plan of Attack all the time in my speeches. I didn't tonight, but I quote so often that I probably should pay you royalties. Now, I foolishly said, no, no, I should have said how much. <laughs> Never be generous uh, in my business anyway. And, uh, and then I said, what do you quote? And she said, I quote the end of the book when Bush says, uh, history, we won't know, we'll all be dead. And I, I asked, well, why do you quote that? And then she really got on fire. And she's, she's not tall, but boy, she stands there and she said, no other president would ever, ever, ever talk like that. George Washington wouldn't talk like that. Thomas Jefferson wouldn't talk like that. Bill wouldn't talk like that. Notice the new Mount Rushmore. <laughs> Washington, Jefferson, Clinton. It's possible, you never know. Uh, you know, we won't know. We'll all be dead. <laughs> but um, then I, I said, well, what, you know, no other person. And she said, he's a fatalist. And I said, oh, you know, that's true. The, it, there, there is a fatalism in Bush. You do things. You, you, you know, you consult the higher father but not the lower father. You don't. It turns out in deciding to go to war, he did not ask uh, Don Rumsfeld for his bottom line recommendation. I mean, can you imagine Clinton's going to go in, to war and he doesn't ask you? He didn't ask Colin Powell, who was his Secretary of State. He didn't ask his CIA director, George Tenet. Uh, th there was just no consultation in this process anyway, uh, or too narrow consultation. So Hillary Clinton says this about fatalism, and I remember driving back and, and thinking, you know, she's running, and uh, if she's nominated and elected, she'll be in the Oval Office someday, and somebody will come in and ask her, how do you think President Clinton history will judge your decision on something very important? And she'll stare the questioner down and say, I'll write it. That's the difference between George W. Bush and Hillary Clinton. Thanks, Shannon, and, and members of the audience who posed questions this evening. It's obvious that questions could have gone on forever, and I think we all would have sat here with rapt attention. Uh, after the just overwhelmingly over-the-top positive presentation this afternoon, Mr. Woodward turned to Secretary Cohen and said, we should do this again. <laughs> Consider this an invitation to do this again. That can be after your next book or your last book. <laughs> to show you our appreciation, we have gifts for each of you. And if you'd like to come back to the podium for a moment, I'd like to present these tokens of our appreciation. Mr. Woodward, it's safe to say that all of us here tonight have appreciated your work for many years. And we all admire your commitment to the practice of journalism and its core tenets. You and your colleagues keep our society informed and help us citizens make good decisions and hold our leaders accountable. That is a high calling and we're thrilled and honored that you have spent time with us today sharing unique perspectives. What we have for you is, if I can get it out here, something that I'm told is a carriage clock. And the way that you have opened sort of the, the windows of time on history's significant events over the last couple of decades I hope that you will take this and think of the great time that you provided here at the University of Maine. We 
also have for your daughter Diana something to, so that she can remember your visit to Maine as well. As I understand it, she's 12. That's a prime recruiting age for all colleges and universities. <laughs> Mr. Cohen, your generous decision 10 years ago to formalize a permanent association with the University of Maine has made this a better university, and we continue to be humbled and thank you. Cohen Archives and Fogler Library is a rich, valued resource, and your willingness to help us establish this incredible lecture series has been instrumental in helping forward UMaine's teaching and outreach missions. Thousands of students and others have enjoyed these lectures, and they've become a distinctive point of pride for the University of Maine. In recognition of our thanks for all you do for the University of Maine, I'm pleased to present you as well with the UMaine clock Please accept it with our appreciation and admiration. Thank you all for being with us here tonight, and my best wishes for an enjoyable holiday weekend.